fellows. Uh, our next speaker is also a fellow. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Dongying Li. Uh, Yi, yeah, Li, please. Uh, Dongying Li is an assistant professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Urban Planning here at Texas A&M University. Her research investigates the relationship between the built environment and human health, especially how access to nature promotes health and well-being. In her research, she incorporates a range of interdisciplinary methods from GIS, remote sensing, uh, volunteer, uh, volunteer geographic information, biosensing, a variety of other techniques. Um, she's a great partner. We've, we've uh, written a grant together that we're, fingers crossed, we're going to get funded any day now. And um, she is uh, part of this really interdisciplinary collaboration we have. So please join me in welcoming Dong Ying. Thank you so much for this great opportunity. It's my honor to present our research here. Um, so today we're presenting about uh, exposure to nature and children's health and development, um, understandings from life course research. Uh, this is a series of research I'm conducting in collaboration with my colleague, Dr. Matt Browning from Clemson University. So um, screen time of children across different developmental stages have increased tremendously. Although if we look at different sources, they present different numbers, but the consensus is children are spending a lot of time in front of screens and very uh, little time comparing to previous generations outdoors in nature. So what might be the health impacts? Um, classic life, per, uh, life course perspective theory emphasizes how social changes or environmental changes alter the life trajectory of individuals. So there are uh, five principles of life course theory, and one of them is the principle of time and place, which says that um, historical time and places um, are really shaping the trajectory of individuals. Um, and then there's also the principle of um, life stage development, um, which suggests that uh, all life courses stages are relevant and aging and development are life course processes. They don't end, um, you know, uh, development doesn't end at age 18, just because we say age 18 is when you become an adult. So, Guided by guided by the life course theory, um, we collected uh, evidence in terms of studies um, looking at childhood nature exposure and uh, different kinds of outcomes later on in life. And we found out that uh, there are different categories. For example, um, there are studies that presenting physical uh, health related outcomes, uh, mental health related outcomes, lifestyle, nature relatedness and preference related outcomes. And then there's also one study done by my colleague, Dr. Uh, Browning on income. So, um, these are, uh, most of these are recent uh, evidences, and uh, we have a lot more studies on mental health and lifestyle and nature relatedness than the other. Because of that, we did a systematic review, particularly looking at um, childhood, uh, I mean, nature exposure in early life stages and mental health outcome in later life stages. So uh, here we kind of uh, defined um, life course pretty narrowly. Um, we just included studies um, that have like a, a exposure measurement and outcome measurement at different time periods. So on the right, you can see that um, 
the first one here, uh, if it's a cross-sectional study, at the same time point for the exposure and outcome measurement, we didn't include it. But um, if it's um, at different time points or different time periods that are either overlapping or uh, separate, we included the study. So following a systematic review process, uh, we identified a total of 29 studies. Um, this was done uh, in summer 2020. And then uh, you can see a lot of the studies were conducted in Europe, um, likely um, associated with data availability. Um, and then some studies in uh, the United States and uh, Australia and Asia. Um, and we can see that there are a wide range of mental health outcomes that are um, reviewed to be associated with um, early um, um, nature exposure. So these um, different kind of outcomes included um, um, mental disorders, risks for mental disorders, um, self-reported positive and negative emotions and uh, psychiatric symptoms, uh, behavior, um, attentional functioning, as well as subjective well-being. And um, as you can see, the um, number of studies might be small for each of the outcomes, but uh, in terms of the findings that they have, um, overall, we have predominantly findings for significant uh, beneficial impacts of nature across the different categories. In terms of the life stages of these 29 different studies, um, we can see a lot of them actually looked at childhood uh, nature exposure. And in terms of the outcome, some of them looked at um, later childhood, um, adulthood, emerging adulthood, uh, middle adulthood, and uh, late, later adulthood. Um, for example, for behavioral outcomes, all of these studies are looking at child. Uh, behavior, uh, whereas the cognitive related outcomes, some of them are looking at um, uh, cognitive capacity during childhood, some of those are uh, during um, late, later adulthood. So here we wanted to introduce uh, two studies that we did, um, empirical studies, looking at different outcomes, developmental outcomes related to childhood nature exposure. So the first one is um, contact with nature in childhood and sensory characteristics in adulthood. So um, Aaron uh, pointed out the important work by Richard Loof, uh, Lost Child in the Woods. And um, um, some of his um, core arguments associated with nature deficit disorder um, is, sorry, this is uh, highlighted a little off here. So children uh, need nature for healthy development of their senses and therefore for learning and creativity. So um, this kind of um, make us think, so what happens if they don't have access to nature? You know, what happens to their sensory development? Um, and then on the right, um, this is work by um, uh, uh, Robin Moore. Um, and he mentioned that, um, um, in contrast with the kind of uh, um, primary experience of nature outdoors, um, the children get secondary experience of nature in front of a TV or a computer screen. And that kind of experience is a uh, dual, uh, including only the visual and the uh, auditory experience and um, usually distorted or manipulated and uh, um, you know, delivered to children only one way and not that interactive. Um, so we wanted to do an empirical study and collect evidence to see um, if the hypothesis that um, um, children who grow up with different levels um, or concentration of nature um, grow up to show different sensory characteristics. So our main hypothesis is about um, childhood contact with nature and um, sensory characteristics in emerging adulthood. But we also wanted to look at um, whether there's an indirect role that's played by sensory profile um, in terms of the relationship of nature exposure and nature connectedness and creativity. Um, we're doing this study um, in both the United States and 
in China, but the United States data collection is still ongoing. So today I'm presenting the data from China. Um, we did a cross-sectional study um, using retrospective measurement of childhood nature exposure. Um, and uh, this is done um, in um, college students, um, and we had a um, effective sample size of 681 from um, college students in China. Uh, those are students who do not have sensory disorders or any related uh, neurological disorder. Um, we measured the residential uh, exposure to nature uh, using self-reports. Um, the way we did it was um, we asked the children, uh, sorry, the college students to report up to three residences um, that they, uh, from birth to age 18, um, in the order where they lived the longest. And then we asked them to rate in terms of the greenness exposure access um, based on access to parks, um, trees, uh, canopy, and other green space. And then we aggregated this to create a summary score for each individual by weighting those scores by the time, how many years they spent in each residence. And then we measured sensory profile using a standard uh, scale. This is the adolescent and adult sensory profile scale. So this scale uh, measures six different kinds of senses, uh, taste, movement, visual, touch, activity, and auditory uh, processing. And um, um, so pretty much the, the theory is that um, um, there are two different axes um, that are related to a person's sensory pro profile, uh, sensory uh, uh, profile. So one of them is the neurological threshold, which means um, how much of a um, sensory intensity does this person need to register, neurologically register this as a stimuli. Um, so some people, um, they can hear or see uh, very subtle, like colors, lights, um, hear very subtle sounds. Um, some people need that intensity to be a little larger to be able to recognize it. Um, the other one is behavioral response. So uh, this axis means um, like if this person reacts passively or actively uh, to the different sensory stimuli. Um, so by these two axes, um, they divide um, into four different quadrants. And each person will get the score for each of the quadrant based on um, their answers to the questions um, in the scale. And then we measure creativity using the alternative uses test, uh, which is uh, giving people some examples of everyday objects and asking them to um, name unusual uses of the, these objects. Um, and then we measure nature connectedness using nature relatedness scale. Our results showed that um, um, there's significant difference in this is the low registration. Remember, this is one quadrant of the sensory profile. So um, comparing um, childhood uh, greenness exposure of four different uh, quartiles. So uh, people who belong to the first and second quartile had significantly um, um, difference compared to people who were in the third and fourth quartile in terms of childhood uh, nature exposure um, in their uh, low registration uh, quadrant of the sensory profile. So which means that those who grow up with um, more natural residential uh, surroundings are less likely to have the tendency um, to miss subtle uh, sensory stimuli. And then um, looking at the interrelationships between um, sensory profile and uh, creativity and uh, nature relatedness, we found out that um, there are uh, both direct relationships between nature exposure, creativity, and nature relatedness but also an uh, indirect path through low registration, which means that um, our sensory profile actually um, is related or linked with um, outcomes such as nature relatedness and creativity. 
uh, we did test the alternative uh, hypothesis, um, but this one is the one uh, statistically chosen. Um, a second study, uh, this is led by my colleague, Dr. Browning. And uh, for this one, uh, we wanted to look at childhood nature exposure and uh, emotional intelligence in adulthood. Um, we used similar uh, study design, uh, cross-sectional design with retrospective measures. Um, but um, our central hypothesis here is um, the cumulative uh, neighborhood greenness exposure during childhood um, is associated with emotional intelligence in emerging adulthood. Um, so for this one, uh, we use the same um, uh, method to have people report up to three residences um, and then aggregate up um, their nature exposure during childhood. Um, but this is done in the United States and we use objective uh, greenness measure. So uh, NDVI uh, is a vegetation index um, that we use for objective measure of uh, nature exposure. And we measure uh, emotional intelligence using the uh, trait emotional intelligence uh, scale. And then also we control for individual uh, level, neighborhood level, uh, sociodemographic conditions and uh, environmental factors. Um, the results of this study were a little bit unexpected. So in our, both our crude and uh, adjusted models, uh, we did not find uh, significant associations between childhood nature exposure and uh, emotional intelligence in adulthood. But uh, we did more explorations and as we stratified the groups. So uh, when we looked at two different groups, one is, um, children who live in lower medium household income uh, neighborhoods versus children uh, who grow up in higher uh, median household income um, areas. We actually found out that um, those who are um, grew up in lower income neighborhoods, um, the greenness, um, this is um, higher vegetation index. Um, it's actually associated with um, higher emotional intelligence. But somehow the relationship is reversed um, for the uh, children who grew up in higher income neighborhoods. We have some uh, speculations um, as to why this result occurred, but um, uh, we would like to do more research to, to find, find out. Um, there have been a lot of research, uh, especially since 2020 um, on this topic in terms of uh, um, life course, um, nature exposure and health outcome, especially mental health. But we feel like there are still a lot of questions that we could answer. So uh, some of the questions I have are, um, what about the uh, critical window? Is there a window in child development where um, nature exposure is the most important? And if a child misses that window, um, is it, um, can, can it be modified? later on in life. What about the, the mechanisms um, that could link childhood nature exposure to adulthood um, outcomes? Is it um, you know, physical activity or lifestyle that um, um, those children grow, grow into as a habit? Or is it um, uh, neurodevelopment um, or um, develop other developmental outcomes? Or um, is it uh, their preference? Um, or uh, ecological literacy that's really um, playing the role. And um, are the mechanisms um, different between short-term nature outing and long-term nature exposure? Like a 10 minute, um, like a nature experience, uh, window, window view of nature, or a 15 minute nature sound. Um, does that have um, the same uh, mechanism um, in impacting health outcome? as um, like a everyday long-term um, nature exposure. What about the, um, the re shape of those relationships? Um, is it a linear relationship? Is it curved linear? And um, um, we see lags or cumulative effects. And if so, um, what would be the appropriate lag value? 
um, and are there possible harms, not only biologically, but also uh, in terms of green gentrification as we distribute green spaces. We are um, giving some people access and taking away access from other people. So what about, um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, inequalities um, is um, uh, current greening efforts uh, hurting some children? And um, um, what about the interaction between nature exposure and other environmental uh, exposure or factors such as air pollution? Um, what about um, uh, interaction between nature exposure and critical life stages or stressful life events? So if one person experienced a lot of nature while experiencing uh, stressful life events, um, is there a buffering effect of nature? Or if um, this person, um, you know, have been um, exposed to nature a lot in the past, um, does that provide a immunization effect? So all of these are questions that really intrigue me and uh, uh, me and my colleague uh, really would love to invite everyone to join us um, to explore those questions. Um, lastly, uh, I really would like to thank the Center of Health and Nature for the generous support um, on the projects. Um, I'm really lucky to have the opportunity to be involved in uh, this project led by Dr. Chanam Lee. Um, some of the posters presented today will be um, out of this project. And then uh, my colleagues and I have another project uh, also supported by the Center uh, looking at climatic um, climate uh, projections uh, nature-based uh, uh, community design and uh, health-related outcomes. That's all. Thank you very much.